The CIRA Early Years Network is a forum for promoting professional development alongside best practice for the early learning and childcare profession in Scotland. We are part of, come under the umbrella of the Scottish Education Research Association. Uh, we focus on interdisciplinary aims of education, health and social care for early education and childcare childhood studies, as well as concerns of social justice and tackling poverty by encouraging innovation within early learning and childcare research. We also aim to sustain and forge new links with policymakers, practitioners and public. So the, the, the members of this network are committed to expanding research informed practice by building international practice uh, partnerships. Network members have established partnerships in Spain, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, it, Italy, Australia, New Zealand, and we are expanding. And we members are currently involved in working within the SSSC, the Scottish Government, Early Year Scotland, and the Third Sector Organisation. So we recognise the need to invo involve current students, as well as graduates working within the early education field to learn more about the impact uh, of sector developments on children's outcomes as well as promoting and critiquing practitioner research. So that's just a little bit uh, about ourselves. Uh, we are very fortunate this evening to have Drs. Marlies Kostatcher and Christina Constantoni. Um, their session this evening will provide an introduction to the concept of intersectionality as a framework for theory and practice which highlights and challenges the complex structural inequalities of gender, race, class, and other categories. Um, they highlight some questions and debates that rise from importing intersectionality into childhood research, and they'll bring uh, examples from their own research. So uh, Christina Constantoni, she's a senior lecturer at uh, Murray High School of Education in Childhood Studies. Uh, current and recent research projects, I'm just reading your notes, um, include children's rights and inequalities in time of the double humanitarian crisis of austerity and refugee crises, children's human rights and informal learning public play places like community and business play cafes, and children and young people's human rights and participation in research, practice and policy maker, policymaking. She works both in Scotland and cross-national partners in places like Greece, Brazil, Eswatini, South Africa, the West Bank, Gaza and Germany. Marlies uh, is also a lecturer at Childhood Studies uh, at Murray House in Edinburgh and the co-programme director of the BACP. Her research interests include children and young persons experience of intersectional inequalities, children's rights and participation and the emotional politics of childhood and she's particularly interested in qualitative participatory and arts-based research methodologies. And Marlies has a practical background in social work and support with children and young people. And full disclosure, they are my supervisors uh, on my, my current PhD journey. So um, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna hand over to Marlies and Christina and they'll give their um, presentation. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna break into small groups uh, for discussion. Um, so if you've got any questions or anything, so that'll be about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll come back and then there should be like a 20, 25 minute Q&A session with Christina and Marlies. Um, so I'm handing over. Thank you, Liz. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Great. Um, yeah, thank you for, very much for this invitation and it's really nice to be here and nice to see some familiar names as well and thank you for that introduction, Liz. Um, so yeah, as Liz said, we're going to talk a little bit about intersectionality in childhood research and really looking forward to have some discussion with all of you around how we can learn more and, and improve our practice and research around these issues. So before we get started, we wanted to invite you just to do a little reflective activity. Um, we have a range of activities like that that we do in our classrooms um, uh, at the university, but we won't have time to go into a full on exercise. But I would just like to invite you just for a couple of minutes to look at the questions in the middle of this identity wheel, 
Um, so it asks about what identities you think about most often, which do you think about least often, what you would like to learn more about, which of these do you think have the strongest effect on how you perceive yourself and how others perceive yourself. Um, and you can see it has a, li a, a list of different identities. So I'll just give you a minute just to think about this. You don't have to share your answers in the chat, but if you want to share any reflections, you're very welcome to. This is just a little exercise to bring us into the space of thinking about identities and intersectionality. And I think it's when we, if we had more time, it, it's um, exercises like this one can open up really interesting conversations about which identities matter in which contexts, um, you know, also issues around stereotypes or prejudice and so on. Okay, feel free to share any thoughts in the chat throughout anyway, um, and I'm going to move on. So today we're talking about childhood and intersectionality, a little bit about the background and origins of the concept. Um, then we're sharing some reflections from research projects and we're going to conclude with some questions for research policy and practice. So you've probably come across the name Kimberly Crenshaw. She's the person that is usually um, associated with coining the term intersectionality. Um, and this is a quote from her influential paper called The Marginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. Um, and it's basically, um, she highlights how the intersectional experience is always greater than the sum of racism and sexism, and therefore any analysis um, that takes intersectionality seriously has to take always the combination of these different forms of oppression into account. Um, but as uh, Patricia L. Collins and Selma Bil Bilsch have written, um, Kimberly Crenshaw has built on a, la a huge amount of um, previous work. Um, I think she can be credited, they, they say she can be credited with bringing the concept in, of intersectionality into academic circles. And it's fair to say that it has really spiraled from there and it has traveled a lot over the last few decades and gained a lot of traction. But it has been existing as a concept for much longer. So some would say Sojourner Truth in 1851 in her entire woman speech has already coined intersectionality. And then others very influential papers by Combahee River Collective, Francis Beale, um, Tony Kate Bambras. So, a lot of um, really influential um, black feminist activists over the last decades. Um, and I think for me and Christina, someone to mention as well is um, Akugo Emejulu, who's a professor at Warwick University, who we personally are really indebted to in terms of our learning about intersectionality. So, um, there's often in intersectionality a debate or a question about, is it about identities or is it about inequalities? Um, and I think our answer would be, it is about both. It is about always the interaction of different categories of difference in terms of identities and inequalities. So while it, um, it is about um, structural inequalities and not about individual identities, the two are of course always inextricably linked. So it's much more about how things work rather than who people are. Um, and the identities or the categories that become relevant um, depend basically on the context um, of the study and the particular power dynamics. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have to keep moving my videos around the screen because it always covers up my slides. Um, so for Christina and me, I think we both came to intersectionality during our PhDs. Um, when we did our PhD research, um, Christina in nurseries and me in a P1. Um, and then we found each other and we wanted to explore this a bit more. So we had an opportunity to work together on a couple of projects that were really looking at how intersectionality can be used within the field of childhood and youth. Um, so the first one here was a knowledge exchange project and the second one was um, building on from that with the same partners, um, a project on tackling intersectional experiences of discrimination of children and young people in schools. 
Um, so these are just some images from the work with the, um, young people as part of these projects. And a lot of times when we started that work, people were saying, you have to stop using this word around young people because it's a difficult theoretical concept. It won't mean anything to them. But of course it did. Um, and in fact, some of the young people also came up with their own definition of intersectionality, which they said was used to describe to how people are treated because of their sexuality, age, race, disability, class, and how these connect and stop people from doing the things that they want to do in life. So this is a pretty strong, straightforward definition that the young people, um, the young um, boys in the right-hand corner came up with. Um, over to you, Christina. Thank you, Marlies. Um, I think the key thing about intersectionality and why I'm really driven from it too is because it's both a theory but it's also a practice. Um, so through intersectionality, um, we can really kind of unpack children and young people's lived experiences in different spaces, places, and times. So it really kind of allows for analysis of that complexity. As Marley said, it looks both at identities and structures. So kind of links to power relations, structural privileges and inequalities. And, and also really important is the praxis. So children and young people are considered competent, knowing agents. There is a focus on participation and um, social justice activism. One of the critiques as it has traveled across disciplines, across fields, is sometimes race is not always part of the analysis. And black feminists um, would be really criticizing that and seeing it as a symbolic vi um, violence of their work. So I think also when we're thinking about intersections um, and as we're traveling around, also kind of remembering that race should not be taken away. It should also be part of the analysis of gender and class and disability and other categories of difference. And when we say race, it does also include um, critically thinking about whiteness too. Um, some, another thing is that intersectionality is not just a framework to analyze these in complex interactions. Um, but it's also a counter hegemonic praxis. So it seeks to challenge and displace hegemonic whiteness in the naming and legitimating of particular kind of politics, policy making, and knowledge production. For me, it's really a, a powerful analytical tool. Um, next slide, please, Marlies, um, for understanding critically processes of participation. Um, who is participating? Which children? How is power exercised? Who is in? Who is out? Why? And it's not just about listening to views, but it's also about challenging discrimination when that occurs. Um, what has been very influential uh, for both me and Marlies is work by Akugo Majulu, and it came out from the seminar series where she just put across these questions and I, these questions just go with me everywhere in terms of my research, my practice, even being a parent. Um, so it's just something that I thought we would share with you in terms of doing intersectionality in our research and in our practice. The first one, she says, how can intersectionality help me to understand my own identities, privileges and disadvantages? So my own assumptions and actions, which children count in the mainstream practices and campaigns in the children's rights field, which children and young people are left out and why, and how do these dynamics of race, of class, of gender, sexuality, disability and others shape children and young people's lives? <clears throat> how do these dynamics serve also as resources for children and young people? And I think that's really important, not seeing people only as kind of victims of structural inequalities, but also really seeing their agency and activism and what kinds of, of alliances need to be built across different groups to effectively address children, young people's intersectional inequalities. We'll come back to these questions at the end, but now over to you, Marlies. Okay, so now we're just um, sharing some reflections from recent research projects. And my case study is around a group of projects with uh, colleagues and young people in Colombia that are, so they're not um, 
young children, um, their older children and young people. And then afterwards, Christina is going to talk about her recent work with younger children as well. So this project in particular um, is located in Quibdó, a city in the Colombian Pacific. Um, it's um, a series of projects that we've been working on with the same team for a couple of years. Overall, the aims were to generate dialogue between different neighborhood groups because this is an area of um, post-conflict tensions and um, some inter-neighborhood violence, um, to make visible young people's views, to look at the potential of participatory arts and music for reconciliation, and then also as an aim that came out of the young people's interests themselves to build, um, to, to provide them with social enterprise and business training and support them to set up um, business developments. Originally, it was supposed to be a, an in-person project with a lot of creative methodologies, but due to the pandemic, we had to move completely online. So we tried to recreate some of that through um, online um, creative methodologies as well. So just some reflections on how intersectionality has been um, useful in terms of um, shaping and doing research. I think um, many have said it's an analytical tool for researching power. So it has been a really helpful framework for shaping the focus and framing the study and also the analysis. One of our research questions was specifically about the young people's identities and intersectional positions. Um, but it's also something that just goes throughout in terms of constantly drawing attention to how power relations shape social phenomena and interactions. In terms of methodology, it has also been a really helpful critical tool. So like Christina was saying, it's key for considering who the participants are that we invite. Um, I think both me and Christina had experiences of working with gatekeepers where it's sometimes tricky if gatekeepers make certain decisions for you in terms of who the children are that they bring in and the children that they keep out. Um, especially in digital projects, I think that raises a, a whole other lot of issues around who is included and excluded in the di digital sphere. Um, and finally, also we've thought um, as a project team that intersectionality was a really well-suited framework for participatory arts-based action research or maybe the other way around, that research was really useful for um, yeah, um, thinking about intersectionality. Some of our co-researchers said that um, using arts has been really transformational for them. Others have said that arts can create a space for people from different backgrounds to come together, to express this complexity, and also to unify people across very different backgrounds. Um, another thing um, where intersectionality is really helpful for sharpening our focus, I think, is in terms of thinking about research relations and broader knowledge politics. So both the power relations within our adult research team, um, as well as within the young people's group, the young people co-researcher group, and then across those two groups as well. Um, and they're very complex because obviously we're talking about teams located in the global south and global north. But at the same time, there were also many additional layers of powers, power within those relationships too. Um, specifically working within a um, GCRF funded project, which is essentially um, UK developmental aid funding, brings quite particular power dynamics and a lot of baggage in terms of you know, how research is conceptualized, who is conceptualized as the people that know and the, the people that benefit from research and so on. We've been thinking a lot about issues to do with representation and like Cara Blaisdell says about avoiding damage narratives, which is also something that is quite um, common in a lot of these types of projects. And to just critically interrogate knowledge claims throughout in terms of who claims um, certain statements and and where, what is the other view in those and, and how are people represented. And I think that li links also to another really important issue around intersectionality, positionality, and ethics. Um, Ashley Christofferson has written a really great paper around this, and she has raised a lot of critical questions, some of which are here. Um, so just asking ourselves, why am I researching this? What is my relationship to the topic? What are the politics? What are my politics? 
do I have the right to do this research and what gives me the right? Am I doing justice to the theories whose, the theories whose work I am using? And how is my social position explained or made visible to the young people, children and young people? And what does all this mean for informed consent? And like Christina said, it's really important to think about as um, white women researchers located in a kind of global North University context, it's really important to think about those identities in relation to these questions. So I think um, thinking about this project and then in relation to early childhood, I think a lot of the questions around power, positionality, reflexivity, privilege, and so on, are just equally valid and important, whether it's young children or older children. I think maybe that in early childhood, some questions around age-based hierarchies and age-based competencies are sometimes a bit more heightened. But at the same time, I think they're also sometimes more easily overlooked because the age-based hierarchies are so normalized, especially with young children, that they often tend not to be questioned enough. And I think it makes it more tempting to speak or act on behalf of young children for adults, both researchers or practitioners and, and other responsible adults. Thinking about intersectionality as a praxis, like Christina and Nakuga were writing, um, I think there is perhaps also a different, slight difference in terms of translating research into action or activism. In our projects, the young people were quite clear on what they wanted, where they wanted to take it. And it was um, perhaps clearer to see what they wanted to do and what support they needed from the adults around them. Whereas with young children, there is perhaps more reliance on intermediary adults, um, parents, practitioners, and so on. And, all the power relations that come with that. Um, but I'm going to pass on to Christina now. Thanks, Marlix. Um, so I'm just going to focus with, um, on kind of reflecting um, on research that I've conducted with very young children. And through this, I'm going to try to um, show or share with you and reflect with you um, the operationalization of intersectionality as an approach. Um, I will share a, a story of a couple connected projects and, and hopefully that um, kind of uh, provides examples of that operation, you know, in practice, what does that mean? So the first project, <clears throat> it's about young children's rights in humanitarian crisis, and particularly the interconnections between austerity at that time and the refugee crisis. I drew on um, ethnographic and participatory work with very young children, zero to five, and their families. It was seven families in total. And we worked together in their homes and their communities within the Greek context. Um, and we were, I was really interested in understanding the effects of this crisis, in, especially in relation and to the implication to children's rights. It was for about three months. Um, so it was just a pilot study, but it was a lot of in-depth um, work came out of it. So that's why it's quite significant to share with you. Um, other methods included focus groups and interviews with policy and practice stakeholders, um, ethnographic and participatory approaches and interviews with families. The families um, were uh, from a range of diverse backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, some uh, people talking about living in poverty, some people defining themselves and families as middle class, two refugee families and one family um, de describing themselves as second generation migrants. There were approximately five to seven visit, visits for each family. It did um, vary just depending on the family um, and what they wanted. Um, the beauty um, of ethnographic research is that immersion in the everyday life, um, which really kind of helps to understand the, the lived experiences, the different emotions, the power dynamics and how they change and participant observation, participating in their everyday life, in their homes, walking around in neighborhoods and communities, visiting community spaces together. So being part of their everyday life and drawing on their own participatory methods. So for example, if a child really liked to draw, then that became a tool. If the child or children really liked photography or singing or dancing, these everyday acts became uh, powerful participatory tools. And the next slide, Marlies. 
um, just shows the range of the different communities and families um, that, well, that I was working with. Um, and I won't go into the uh, details of all of the findings, but I think one of the key findings was that the project showed the deep intersectional inequalities that different children were experiencing depending on their intersectional positionings. Uh, I will draw particularly one key finding, which is linked to accessing public life and spaces, which then led to follow-up research projects, um, community events, and the creation of an anti-racist early years collective, which I will talk about towards the end. Um, so when I'm thinking about intersectionality as an approach and the operationalization of it, I'm reflecting both uh, in terms of the methodological approach, um, but also in the reflecting in terms of processes of change. The next slide, um, Marlise. Um, if we're thinking about intersectionality as a research approach, and reflecting on that kind of methodological approach, I think it's important to really focus on from, from the beginning to the, of the inception of the idea, data design, uh, data generation, collection, analysis, and the messiness of all that in between, um, but also seeing you know, intersectionality as a reflexive tool for researchers to really unpack their roles um, in the research process. Intersectionality really helps to understand through dialogue, both the lived experiences of um, individual experiences of intersectional identities in different spaces, places and times and intersectional structural power relations, which unpack both um, privileges and oppression and which can manifest in different contexts and through different subjects and groups and which uncovers both explicit but also subtle forms of discrimination, including the powerful meaning of silences. <coughs> it also offers um, a useful reflexive tool for researchers to question their intersectional research roles and the implication that their identities and roles have in the research practice, including hegemonic whiteness. And lastly, um, it's committing childhood researchers to emancipatory activist and political agenda for change, which challenges intersectional discriminations and promotes complex social justice claims. And I think that's really important and something I would like to re critically reflect with you in terms of that political agenda of change. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> um, the next slide, Marlies. Um, so when we're thinking about intersectionality, um, as we said, it's thinking both about the lived and the embodied experiences across situated contexts and places, so spatiality coming into the analysis, times, um, temporality, and those kind of relations of hierarchy and inequality at different social locations and emergent positionalities within space and within time. I found Anthias's uh, quote here really, really um, interesting and helpful because she talks about how um, intersectionality focuses on concrete relations of positionality and hierarchization. I can never say that word right, <laughs> but you know what I, what I mean. However, these do not necessarily work in a coherent way, <clears throat> nor other places or positions mutually exclusive. These may lead to complex forms of hierarchy across a range of different dimensions. So for example, if I go back to my own project, um, the next slide, Marlies, please, thank you. Um, the, the data highlighted that children faced many inequalities while trying to access public life and spaces. And uh, like, for example, community and business cafes, the majority of the public play spaces were not inclusive for children generally, but in particular for children and families from socially disadvantaged or black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Some of the inequalities that children and family face um, <clears throat> were linked to exclusion, racism, discrimination, judgment, especially if the families did not fit the middle class background norm. And we could see that there, when there, there was resistance um, from children and families, and that, of, that resistance was offer, uh, all, um, often uh, faced by pushback and judgment, which was often racialized, was gendered, and it was classed. 
Uh, I think a key question for me when I'm personally using intersectionality is that question of whose childhood counts, which children. Um, and I think that's a kind of a question that always is in my mind whenever I'm conducting her research or when in any kind of practice, thinking just about who's involved, who's here, who's not here, which voices am I listening to more and I'm more tuned into, which am I kind of more silent, and why is that happening? <clears throat> and the next Slide, um, I, I think Collins Black Feminist Epistemology is really um, useful and can be adopted in any childhood research. Uh, Collins talks about knowledge that is built on lived experiences. It is um, come to understood through a dialogue. Now, in terms of early childhood, when we say dialogue, there kind of seems to be um, it's not just the verbal communication, it's any kind of form of communication, nonverbal um, included. And knowledge is based on an ethics of caring. So empathy and compassion is really important. It does require personal accountability and responsibility. And the, the, it's really important to understand that knowledge and knowing cannot be separated by political values and individual beliefs. So within a black feminist epistemology, you embrace that and you analyze that through reflexivity. And I'm coming towards the final points now. Um, Akuga Majulu has really made me think about um, that intersectionality is not just about diversity. It's, it's not just about including different groups in institutions, but it's about seeking the transformation of these institutions, so not the insertion of marginalized groups into broken systems. And this is a direct quotes from Akugo. Um, what Akugo was also talking about was that intersectionality has moved from black feminist activism to academia, to policy and practice. It is a very powerful tool to discuss multidimensional inequalities and disadvantages. But um, she says, and she warns, it has been used in, in ways that um, abused, it has been used and abused in ways that dilutes its radicalism. So that made me reflect generally about my projects, this, the research processes, and um, that aspect about change. And you'll find similar debates generally in, in kind of theorizations around participation with children in terms of research. So what I wanted to do now is I won't go through all of these projects, but it was just to show how from some of the key findings from the children and the young people and the families about the experiences of inequalities that they were facing in public spaces led to a, a lots of different other projects. And it was mainly to understand more further, more in depthly the politics of these spaces and part of these projects also include some uh, community-based projects. So for example, a pop-up play cafe, uh, which was organized in um, Edinburgh, in a neighborhood which was facing disproportionately high unemployment and drug alcohol abuse. The aim of the pop-up play cafe was to engage with families to understand, and children to understand their experiences of current provision and access to public spaces and also to start with them to provide alternative spaces based on pedagogical child-centered and children's rights approaches and together to start co-designing and reimagining what would be an ideal social and play space. Um, and the other one that I'd like to highlight is that's coming up when COVID allows, <laughs> um, the We Play Festival, um, which is a project uh, which aims to prototype a radical new public space, which will include um, a combination of play, of seminars, of workshops, community development through a long uh, pop-up play cafe uh, festival. Uh, I won't go into the details, but if you want to know more, I'm happy to discuss about this. So just thinking generally about all the things around intersectionality when I was that, operationalizing that within my research practice. The next slide, Marlies. Um, I've been thinking really hard about this commitment to change, but also the ethical challenges 
that that has. So for example, when we're saying that we're adopting a participatory and intersectional approach, but there's not really being, I'm not, but I haven't really been able to change anything or, or change might take a lot of time. So it does raise kind of ethical dilemmas for the researcher. Um, it, it, we are embedded in structural relations. So for example, when I conducted um, that project in Greece, I had just come back after a maternity leave. It was only a, a tiny piece of work in terms of funding. So in terms of what I could do, uh, but it also came into um, a very high workload that I was trying to address. So there's challenges, I think, for the researchers also within those structural institutions that we're at, we're, at, we're within. And then that has implications in terms of the research processes and then subsequently to the, to the, the aspect of change. And also thinking of, um, of circumstances like, for example, COVID-19, the impact of COVID, and then the, what that kind of implication has to research processes too. The other thing um, I was really reflecting with the communities um, is there's challenges when you're researching communities which are far away from you, not within context that you're in and that you live in, and then you move away. And I, I, I find that really like a big ethical dilemma, but I shared that with uh, participants about, about that. So being really honest about the dilemmas of that. Um, so start, staying connected through personal contacts and through the NGO, but it's really interesting to see, you know, time passes, children were growing up, um, communities were moving, so the very dynamic spaces. So another, another kind of ethical dilemma there. I was also really aware, and that's something about when you, when you say that you're operationalizing intersectionality, thinking about your own self. So being a white Greek uh, Briton, middle class identity, I had a lot of privileges in that space. So the fact that I could at that time um, go on a, a plane and travel between Scotland and Greece, not just now because of COVID, but then I could do that. And knowing when we was in there, when we were, we were in the refugee camps that I was speaking to community, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. So separated from their families, from children, and that was a really ethical, um, it was, it was really difficult to kind of think about that within that context. But again, I did share, I was very honest with the communities and we were reflecting together about that. But what I also found is that I was a little bit more harsh with myself. So what I remember one of the uh, mothers in the refugee camp saying, do you know it, that she really valued that time of being together. It was something different to her everyday life within the camp. Um, and then she was sharing both her hopes, but also her pain. And then it was just that human connection. And that made it a really, for her, a significant process. And she also found it a very therapeutic um, process because she could share with somebody that she felt was empathetic and was listening. So even though I couldn't change anything with her at that moment. Um, and it was really interesting, the concept of food. So when I would come to the refugee camp and then she would take over this mother, um, you know, offering food, creating these delicious desserts. And it was something about that role uh, and me taking care of me that also she really valued. So that was really interesting to reflect with her. Um, but I'm really aware about who I am and the color of my skin. Um, when and the, the ethics of when you're saying you're doing intersectionality. And that's why I have reached out to other women of color and together we have formed uh, the Anti-Racist Early Years Collective. And I'll talk a little bit about an upcoming um, webinar that we'll be gonna do together. So I'll share that with you. Um, so what else was I gonna say here? Uh, yes, yeah, so questioning again, which children and thinking about activism. So the last point is just a few details about the Anti-Racist Early Years Collective, which is a group of academics, of researchers, of practitioners, teachers, community activism, working to, together uh, towards promoting anti-racist education across the early years sector. And you might be interested in this upcoming webinar, which is called Who Defines Childhood Innocence, Anti-Racist Practice, um, which is the next slide, Marlies. Uh, 
thank you. White fragility and effective allyship in early childhood. 10th of May, one to half two. If you're interested, it would be perfect to reconnect with you again. So just to finalize our talk with Marlise um, and our reflection seat. So key points about intersectional work. There's this emphasis both on the intersections of identities and structures of powers, the importance of recentering race in any kind of analysis that we're doing. So it doesn't get avoided because sometimes you, you find um, it's a taboo subject matter. So sometimes we just leave it at the side, but I think it's really important to be part of that analysis of identities and, and structural inequalities. The importance of centering uh, children and young people's own views and experiences. Of course, they're not the only ones. They're embedded in a community of practice, of parents, of families, practitioners, wider politics. So it's really important to think about them also within the, the context. Thinking up critically about participation, but also alongside that, the importance of anti-discriminatory practice, the importance of personal and professional reflexivity as an ongoing process. Um, for, for us with Marlies, the kind of connections and the learning um, across disciplines. So what can childhood and youth studies learn from intersectionality, but also what can intersectionality learn from childhood and youth studies and connecting the two? And I think it's for us to think also partnerships that would make a difference. So I think Marlies, now we were hoping that we would revisit the questions. And Liz, I don't know if this is the time to, to go into little groups. We were wondering with Marlies, if you want to think a little bit about these questions, you might want to address some of these or some of the, oh, you don't have to, if it just, or you want to reflect generally about what you've just heard. So you have a freedom in whatever you choose to do. But we've just put some of these questions here if you wanted to facilitate. Uh, how long do, does everybody have, Liz? And you're muted, you Oh, you need to unmute. I can hear, see your mouth. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like me to have my mouth going. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, probably about 15 minutes. So in small groups, so that would allow uh, these sort of conversations um it's really good that you've actually sort of put these back up so um we can post these in the chat if uh if people want them um yeah so if we, we break off into uh small groups just to have a bit of uh a conversation reflect on what we've heard and then uh if we bring back uh if we come back together we'll have hopefully about 15 to 20 minute q and a uh with Christina and Marlies, if that sounds okay with everybody. <laughs> 